Hello, welcome back um, to uh, now a, a number of contributed talks uh, to the Hot UF workshop. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Swan from Carnegie Mellon University. And Andrew will talk about the Nielsen Schreier theorem in homotopy type theory. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I'll start by defining what is the Nielsen Schreier theorem. So it's a very uh, simple sounding theorem. It just says that every subgroup of a free group is uh, itself uh, as a group, also a free group. So it kind of sounds very simple, but uh, it's actually surprisingly uh, tricky to prove. So the uh, original uh, proofs by Nielsen, Nielsen and Trier were kind of quite uh, long and kind of also very a bit like un unintuitive, like there's a few details that you might uh, kind of probably wouldn't, wouldn't guess uh, at first. And um, it turns out that the uh, best way to kind of understand what's going on is using ideas from algebraic topology. So the, um, <clears throat> so the kind of first proofs using kind of topological ideas were by uh, Bayer Levi and uh, Chevalli uh, Herbrand. And uh, I think this is probably the most commonly used proof these days, just because it's kind of much clearer. Uh, but this use of algebraic topology meant this is a kind of, this is a uh, kind of ideal candidate theorem to formalize in hot. And the the reason for this is that <clears throat> in hot we can use the ideas from the algebraic topology proofs, but uh, we don't actually need. Uh, topological spaces and uh, fundamental groups and stuff, we can just take the ideas and use them in a much more uh, direct way using, um, uh, using kind of types directly. And uh, this, this gives us um, a proof which is intuitive using the topological ideas, but it's also very easy to formalize because it's uh, very uh, direct. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start by kind of reviewing how uh, group theory works in HOT. Uh, so hopefully many of you are already familiar with this, so I'll go through it quite fast. Um, so in uh, HOT, we can use this alternate, uh, alternate definition of group based on the intuition or thinking of groups as all being the fundamental groups of spaces. Uh, so we define a group to just be a pointed type such that the underlying type is one truncated and uh, connected. And uh, this also gives us a notion of homomorphism, which is just a pointed map. And, um, and so we can relate this back to the more traditional definition of group um, in terms of set with a binary operation. And uh, how we do this is we just note that uh, since uh, base e since uh, the type is one truncated, the equality type base equals base is a set. Um, so that's on the underlying set, and then we can concatenate paths to um, uh, to get this kind of binary operation. Um, so um, yeah, so so this kind of hot definition is kind of essentially using higher types. And it's in a way, it's actually simpler than the usual definition of group because we don't have to carry around the binary operation as data. It's, it's kind of it's just built into the into the type itself. So this is a kind of a simplification, uh, but it's equivalent to the more usual definition. So we can transfer backwards and forwards if if we if we need to. Uh, okay, so now I've defined groups. So I'll talk about uh, subgroups. So we use, for this, we use covering spaces. So a, uh, a covering space is just a map from the underlying type of the group into sets. Um, so it's a kind of family of types over the, over the, um, over the group. Um, Uh, so, yeah, so, so a covering space is a family of types over the group. 
uh, which is zero truncated. Um, is, is, is there anyone else having uh, display problems with the talk? Uh, I, I mean, I, I just I just carry on. I carry on. Um, so a, uh, a pointed covering space is a uh, covering space together with a uh, point over the base. And uh, we say it's connected um, if um, the total space is uh, connected uh, as, as a type. And now we can define subgroups. They're just uh, pointed connecting covering space. Okay, and um, then every subgroup of a group is a group itself uh, by kind of forgetting that it's a, a subgroup. And to get the underlying group, we just take the uh, total space of this family of types, and then we need a point, and we've got this um, x naught that we can use together with base to, to get a point. Uh, okay, and uh, I'm going to refer to this um, the, the set of points over the base as the uh, index of the subgroup. Uh, so this is uh, useful later for, for technical reasons. Uh, okay, so that's subgroups. Now, uh, free groups. Uh, so free groups are just um, these uh, higher inductive types. So we're given a set A, and then we freely want the group um, containing A. So we just define the higher inductive type, which has a base point, and then for every element A of the set, we add a path from uh, the base point to itself. Uh, and then we also we add one truncation. And um, yeah, and then this satisfies the uh, usual uh, universal property for, for free groups, but I, I, won't, I won't use this today, so I'll, I'll skip over that. Okay, so now I've given these kind of definitions in HOT, I can state the HOT version of the nielsen trier theorem. So uh, it says that if we're given a set A, and uh, we can use this to define the uh, free group uh, BF of A, um, and we're given a subgroup, so this is a covering space on uh, BF of A. Um, then, the underlying group of the subgroup, this total space, is merely equivalent to some uh, free group BFB for uh, some set B. Um, yeah, and okay, so, so I probably won't have time to go into detail about this, but um, um, actually, this, this theorem in general it needs the um, axiom of choice. Uh, I mean, it works in HOT, but you just need to assume the axiom of choice as well. Uh, but and then there's also a kind of fully constructive proof when um, the uh, index of the subgroup is finite. So so that one has been uh, formalized in uh, um, in Agda. Uh, but I don't think I have time to go into more details about that. Um, right. So so in order to kind of understand the proof, it's important to um, uh, do some very basic uh, graph theory. So uh, a graph is just a pair of types. Um, yeah, I'm going to take these to be sets, so that I guess for the definition it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so let's say a pair of sets, E and V, of edges and vertices. And uh, together with two maps, which uh, today I'm calling pi 0 and pi 1. And so, um, so pi 0 and pi 1 of an edge E are the uh, endpoints of, of the edge, so these are vertices. And, okay, and then given a graph, we can define the co-equalizer of the graph. Uh, so this is just a simple higher inductive type where uh, for every vertex, we add a, add a point uh, square brackets. Um, so given a vertex V, we add a point square brackets V to the co-equalizer. And then given every edge, we add a path from the first endpoint of E to the second endpoint of E. And uh, for today, I'm going <clears> to <throat> refer to the one truncation of the co-equalizer as the uh, geometric realization of the graph. So the way, the, the way we kind of visualize this 
is that we can, if we're given a graph, we can view it as a topological space and we construct the space by just adding a point for each vertex. And then for each edge, we add a, a path in the topological space from uh, one endpoint to, to the other. Um, so, so today I'm gonna use this name for the one truncation of, of the co equalizer And uh, in particular, um, we can see the definition of a free group like that uh, gave before due to Kraus and Alstenkirch. Um, this is a special case of the, of the geometric realization of a graph. And it's exactly um, the geometric realization of those graphs where, the, where there's just one vertex. So if we have for like one vertex and um, a set of edges and the uniquely defined endpoint maps, uh, this gives us, um, uh, yeah, we take the geometric realization and then we get the same definition of uh, free group that I, that I gave before. Okay, so um, right. So now the uh, proof of the Nielsen Schreier theorem in HOT uh, proceeds in two steps. So the first step is to show that. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I just answer for Verna's question here. So um, uh, yeah. So so this is um, the formal definition is exactly this: a set of edges and a set of vertices of endpoint maps. Uh, so they are directed. Uh, yeah, pi zero and pi one can be any functions. Uh, so yeah, and then loops are okay. And then this is important for free groups because for free groups, it's, it's only loops that you have. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Um, so, um, right, so the proof of the Nielsen Schreier goes into uh, two steps. So the first step is to show that any subgroup of a free group is a geometric realization of the graph. And then the second step is to show that the geometric realization of any graph, uh, well, uh, a graph under certain assumptions is, is a free group. Um, so the um, first part is, um, yeah, it's just a kind of special case of a lemma that appears in the hot book called uh, flattening. Uh, so flattening just says that we have a co-equalizer and a family of types in the co-equalizer, then the total space of the family of types is also a co-equalizer. And um, we can even get an explicit description of what uh, of the graph that it's a co-equalizer of. Um, so yeah, uh, but I'll skip over what it is exactly. Um, so um, we just apply this flattening, this kind of special case, in fact, of the flattening lemma to um, a graph with um, one vertex and a point and an edge for each element of A. And this gives us the uh, first part of the proof. So it says that um, if we're given uh, a set, a free group on the set and a covering space, then we have this equivalence that the total space is uh, this kind of geometricalization of a graph which has one point for each element of the index. And for every element of the uh, generating set A and every vertex, we have an edge. So I kind of drew a quick picture here to um, kind of illustrate a typical example of, a, of an index two subgroup. So for every, so here's a group down here. It's uh, just a vertex with two loops uh, because they've got two generators. And um, then it's index two. So every point in the graph here has two points above it. In particular, the base point has uh, two, two points above it. And then these are the vertices of, of uh, this graph here. And uh, then we have some kind of loops here. Uh, so this is just kind of a typical example. There are like others even for index two subgroups of um, this, this free group. Um, okay, so then the next step is to show the geometric realization of a, uh, a group. Uh, that, so so uh, now I need to show the geometric realization of a graph is a free group. So uh, to do this, I show you that there's a bit more kind of graph theory that we can formalize in HOT. And um, 
Uh, yeah, and so some kind of important concepts in basic graph theory can be phrased using geometric realization. And the surprising thing for me was that we only need these hot versions that I'm about to show you, and we don't need kind of more more kind of classical definitions. So if I kind of maybe show you the definitions, I can make this a bit clearer. Um, so if we're given a, uh, a graph, we uh, define a, a path and two vertices, V and V prime, and a path from V to V primed is a proof that V equals V prime in the geometric realization. Uh, so this is uh, simpler than the usual definition, which says that a path is a, uh, a sequence of edges. Um, so, so, you know, for, for example, if you have kind of a sequence, if you have kind of three uh, vertices and then two edges, then we can have a path from one end to the other, which just goes one edge and then, then the other. Um, but alternatively, we can just say that it's a, a path in the, um, in the sense of an uh, element of the equality type for the geometric realization. Um, so, so again, this is a this is a kind of a simple this is a simplification of the more more usual uh, definition. And then, so we can use this to define what a connected graph is. So, a graph is connected if its geometric realization is a connected type. So, this is in other words, it's merely inhabited, and for any two vertices, there merely exists a path from one to the other. And we say a graph is a tree if its uh, geometric realization is contractible. Uh, so in general, a type is uh, contractible um, if and only if it's both connected and zero truncated. So if we apply this to the geometric realization, um, this says that the graph is a tree when it's connected and any path from a vertex to itself is uh, trivial. Uh, so, so I guess in, in graph theory, these would maybe be called uh, cycles, these paths from a vertex to itself, and um, any such is trivial. So th this is kind of relating the, um, the hot definition to the more kind of classical one that you might, might see in, uh, in basic group theory, uh, graph theory. Okay, and then using um, trees, we can define uh, spanning trees. So a uh, spanning tree is, uh, so it's a subgraph with the same set of vertices, but with a, um, a subset of edges uh, such that the resulting subgraph is a tree, like as, as a graph itself. And uh, for kind of technical reasons, I want this uh, subset of edges to be a decidable subset. So, so given an element of E, you can decide if it's in uh, E primed or, or not, uh, just because this is kind of useful for, for the proof. Uh, but the important point is that we um, have a subset of edges that forms a, uh, forms a tree when we use the same, same set of vertices. So, um, uh, yeah, and then so an important lemma, if a graph has a spanning tree, then its geometric realization is equivalent to a free group. So the geometric picture is that we take the um, spanning tree and collapse it down to a point, uh, to a single vertex, in other words. And then this, lives, this leaves every edge outside the spanning tree as a uh, loop from this kind of one point that used to be the spanning tree to, to itself. And then formally, it's just this three-line proof. Um, so because I assume that E prime is decidable, it has a complement, which I uh, decided to write down using negation uh, for some reason. Um, and then we just do this kind of three-line three, three line computation that uh, V over the co-product of these two things is, um, well, first of all, we take um, V over uh, the subset of edges in the spanning tree, and then the code close over everything else, and um, then we, um, and then because this is a tree by assumption, the co-equalizer is one. Uh, yeah, I guess there should be um, one truncations everywhere around here, uh, but I just uh, I ignore that. Um, hope that's okay. Uh, and then finally, we actually need to 
um, kind of construct the um, spanning tree itself. Um, so uh, this is the part here where at first I really thought we um, I would need to use the kind of more concrete classical definition of um, path in terms of sequence of edges. But it turns out that even for this kind of very kind of create um, this very um, slightly combinatorial kind of key part of the proof, uh, we, we can still just use the um, nice uh, clear hot definitions. And the, the key reason why we can do this is using uh, this lemma here. Uh, so this says we have a connected graph and we can uh, decompose um, the set of vertices into two components. And we're, and, uh, we're assuming that there exists an edge. Oh yeah, uh, then we can show that there exists an edge whose endpoints lie in different components uh, as long as the graph is connected. Um, let me say that again so it's a bit clearer. We're given a connected graph, the vertices can be decomposed into two components, then there's an edge which crosses from one component to the other, and um, yeah, and there is a constructive proof that you can see in the paper or the act of formalization, um, but I'm going to give a uh, kind of non-constructive version because it's slightly more intuitive, but it's, it's not really any longer, it's just more intuitive. Um, so you can view this Decomp decomposition of V as you know, so a coloring, a map from V to two. And then I'm going to assume for a contradiction that there's no edge that crosses from one component to the other. So in terms of the coloring, this says that for every edge, um, its endpoints have the same color. And this is exactly what we need to define the, to extend the coloring from a function on V to a function on the, on the co-equalizer. Uh, v over E. Um, so I call this C primed, the, uh, the, the extension to uh, V over E. Um, and then kind of reassumed, I wanted to assume that both of these components are inhabited, uh, or if I didn't assume it, I meant to assume it. Um, so let's suppose that we're given V0 in V0 and V1 in V1. Um, yeah, so the, um, and the colorings are different. And then, so uh, by uh, connectedness, there merely exists a um, proof that V0 equals V1 in, uh, in either the curricularizer or the geometric realization. Um, this, is, this is equivalent. Uh, but then we have that the um, Coloring on V0 is this kind of extension of the coloring to um, strip brackets V0, which is, well, we've got a path from this one to this one. Um, so this is equal to the extended coloring on brackets V1, which is equal to the coloring of V1, which then gives us a contradiction as we needed. Um, so that's kind of roughly the, um, oh yeah, and then the construction of the spanning tree is by kind of iterating this uh, lemma. So we just Build up the spanning tree one vertex at a time. We have a um, um, yeah. So at each stage, we uh, have the span. We have a tree that we've constructed so far, and it, and then we take a vertex and then add a um, and then we have uh, some edge which crosses, which has one end on the tree that we've constructed so far and one end outside this tree, and then we add that edge and uh, we do this either finite many times or transfinitely, depending on our assumptions. Um, and then that's how the spanning tree is constructed. And then we can combine it with the earlier part to get the uh, nielsen Schreier theorem as, as, we, um, as we needed. Um, yeah, so, so um, just to kind of summarize, we have a few, few extra points I didn't get time for. Um, so I've uh, formalized, formulated some basic ideas um, well, okay, so yes, yeah, so, so they're already um, a nice formalization of group theory in uh, in HOT. Uh, you can also formulate some like, nice basic class theory in HOT and then use this in the nielsen schreier theorem and use this to kind of simplify the proof and kind of avoid um, some kind of, um, kind of slightly messy parts. Um, uh, there's a constructive proof of the finite index version and you can do the full version of choice. And um, in fact, um, the axiom of choice is strictly necessary because there's a, a Boolean infinity topos where it's false, but uh, I, uh, um, 
yeah, I, I won't talk about that today. So I, I'll finish here. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, let's give you a, rouse, a round of, of applause. Are there any questions for Andrew? Please raise your hands or post your questions in the chat if you have any. Um, maybe I can start with a question. Um, how, um, the, how, how, so I'm, I'm wondering how large your actor formalization is. And the background of the question is, um, can you save a lot on, um, on like did this encoding of groups as uh, of, of free groups um, as these using these uh, higher inductive types. How much work do you save, or, or how much can you profit yeah. from the synthetic aspect? Yeah, so so it's actually quite, quite tricky for me to say this because uh, I'm not uh, that experienced in formalization. So I, I think um, someone be better than me at formalization could make it shorter just by. Um, just by being better at like other aspects of, of the uh, formalizing. So for example, there was uh, an existing proof, I think in, in Lean that uh, I can't remember who did it, but um, that ended up being shorter just by using tactics and um, uh, being, um, uh, you know, just being better at uh, formalizing stuff. Uh, but but what, what I can say is that um, this did improve my formalization a lot when I realized that it wasn't necessary to keep track of sequences of edges. Um, so this is very messy for me. Um, and uh, viewing it as proof of equality in a higher inductive type did actually make it a lot easier for, for me to, to do. Um, it saved, I don't know, uh, let's say 100 lines, say, maybe. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um... The next question was from Mike. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, uh, so should in, in constructive homotopy type theory, should we define a free group to be the uh, classifying space of a graph? So th th because um, you, you have a, a it, it, this is a more general class of groups. Now, it, if we don't have excluded middle or de decidability, right? But Classically, it's just the free groups. Um, so is, is mean, that a, you mean should we one truncate or not one truncate? Is no, no. That... I mean, so so you you had two steps, right? Like you first you show that it's a the classifying space of a graph, and then you show that classifying spaces of graphs are free groups. Right. But so if it did, the the first step didn't use classical assumptions, right? Right. Right. So so the 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 class of classifying spaces of graphs is a is a class of groups which is constructively more general than the free groups. Um, right. Does it act like a better definition of free group in constructive mathematics? Ah, OK, I see. Um, yeah, in, in that case, I just say I, I, I don't know because I don't have like a good enough graph, uh, sorry, good enough grasp of uh, what the properties are of um, this more, more general class. Um, so, so de definitely when I was proving it, I wanted to include the proof of the, the construction of the spanning tree because I see this as um, like a difficult part of the proof. So I, I don't like to prove something by avoiding the difficult parts. I want to uh, <laughs> uh, include those. Um, but um, yeah, you, you could be right. It, it could be that this more general class is also well behaved, but I, I don't know either way at the moment. I think this that's an interesting question because uh, in trying to, to form do some synthetic homotopy theory, we sort of frequently run into the problem that classical arguments involve things like so every vector space has a basis and like split vector spaces have split sort exact sequences and so on. So I'm wondering if maybe there's a more general class of quote unquote vector spaces that would be more useful. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can, can I take one more question before we have to go to the next speaker? Um, uh, Dan, Dan Christensen. Okay. Um, probably we don't have time for this, but I just was curious what this infinity Chanuel topos is. Um, I see we've got like 18 seconds or something though, so maybe. Uh, <laughs> so so I'll say really quickly, it's false in nominal sets and nominal sets is equivalent to a Grafendieck topos. And uh, so 
Uh, and then, so you just take the Infinity version of that Gray from Deep Topos. Yeah, 